picked up the questions, we're given generic answers, and then we maybe go into a bit deeper if it, if it doesn't answer what you want or what you need. Right, Sam, do you want to move on to the first yeah. one? Um, I think for the initial question comes from the old um, curriculum where the modules were signed off. So the question is, how do SIPs get overall sign off? Can different people sign off different SIPs? And how can you show independent practice in the OSAT form? So there's no overall SIP sign off. Uh, the, 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 com the competencies or the equivalences are signed off by whoever you want. You'll go to different people for different equivalences because that's the, 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 the person who's helping out or signing you off will be have their own special interests. And all the forms you require are on the faculty website and certainly available if you use the ePortfolio. Um, and then the OSAT, when we reviewed all our workplace-based assessments, we made the decision that there only would be one OSAT. There wouldn't be a CSER OSAT and a specialty training OSAT because that could lead to total confusion and the wrong person, if you fill in the wrong OSAT, that could scupper everything in your assessment. So there's only one OSAT, which you'll see is very much, you can see where trainees at different levels come into it. But the workplace-based assessments should be, should be quite obvious that you would state that they're summative and fill in the bits that are just relevant to you as a, a CSER applicant, as opposed to especially trainee. And so I had a quick look at the OSAT and it, it, it make, you can make it quite clear on it, it's summative and just make sure the person who's assessing you is aware so they can com complete it appropriately and make the right sort of comment at the end of- Kate, um, can I just come in there? That, 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 that there's, there's two forms, there's the formative OSAT and the yeah. summative. Well, there's two so, now, okay. Yeah, formative and summative. So they're, they're not, um, you don't have to state what the OSAT is, okay. there are two different forms on, on the faculty website, sorry. So when I was looking, the one I found could be either, I think. So the moral of the story is make sure you get the right OSAT then, I think, don't know how I managed that. Okay, Sam, do you want to move on? And I think, yeah, okay, I'll come back to that. A public health project and public health competence are vague. I think if it's, what's a public health project? My advice would be, to use uh, wherever you're working is use your local specialty education supervisor for ideas. And they will also know what contacts there are in public health who will support you through choosing and then what is required for a public health project. It's really a project which shows that you understand public health and use uh, public health resources. Um, and so also speaking to previous CSER applicants and specialty trainees, they can give you an idea what projects they did. Um, they will also know what's current, uh, currently topical, um, locally and nationally. And if you know what's current, and it, sometimes it makes it much easier to de develop, a, develop a project around it, because if it's current, it could be a project that's very useful to the people, to your, your employers. And if you're doing a project useful to them, then they're much more supportive of you doing it, giving you the time and resources that you require. I think it could be said that actually evidence and all the SIPs could be vague, but that's the way the curriculum is now. The curriculum has sl sl uh, swung away from numbers crunching and, and, and time, you know, X procedures, X time, to basically you showing that you're able to do the job. And the specialty curriculum is very much the same. So the burden is on the trainee and the, the supervisor if you're a trainee, or you and anybody who's supporting you and mentoring you through this to just cobble together evidence that would be sufficient to show you have the um, experience which is equivalent to what is required. Now, I know that sounds terribly, terribly vague. The faculty's one aim is to support people through, this, through the CSER process. I know we're going to get lots of questions about how many of what do you need, and we'll be very supportive in that. Um, I know that we've given uh, it's, um, examples of um, you know, possible examples for showing equivalence, and there's, and there's a big list. The big list isn't there because you're expected to give every, an example for all of them. They're just there to help you, give you some ideas and the sort of evidence you can provide, hopefully from your day job or the recent past that you can provide to show that you are doing the equivalent to somebody doing the, the curriculum as a specialty trainee. I think Sarah has a question. Yep, Sarah. Hi, um, so I'm in the process of trying to organize my public health project at the moment. Um, basically my education supervisor wanted me to do a needs assessment um, using obviously public health principles 
um, for HIV patients. We've just cancelled our Terence Higgins Trust um, um, contract. Um, so basically trying to find out local services um, that are available for them that will fulfil that need uh, rather than what the Terence Higgins Trust was doing for them. Um, obviously, my education supervisor, she's, um, she's a consultant in sexual and reproductive health. So it hasn't been organised through public health. I just wanted to check that that wouldn't be an issue as long as we're using the principles of public health to yeah. do it. As, as long as the end product fulfills the requirement, then we'll be happy. I mean, if, if she, I'm quite sure if she was at all worried, she would put you in touch with a public health consultant just to make sure you're on the right lines Mm -hmm. if there are any anxiety around that and that's where I would use public health because the good thing about knowing an education supervisor is that they know all the links all the all the people to go to that are happy to speak to you and give you advice but no you don't have to do anything formally through public health mm -hmm. we're only interested in the quality of the end product okay and because so, obviously with the uh, new curriculum with the SIPs there there aren't the sort of previous sort of syllabus checklist you must be able to do this 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 yep. and this um so it is a little bit more vague than that yep. um so obviously if i i'm looking at previous needs assessments that have been done and i'm sort of following similar templates and trying to get it to the same standard yep. as that should that be adequate Absolutely. yep Bye. thank really you yeah okay sam yep I read that CESA applicants are recommended to demonstrate level five competence, which is you know able to practice independently with all procedures. This isn't the case for trainees. And this caught me by surprise. We went back in and we looked at the SSG and the required by the GMC, because at the end of the day, we're, we're delivering a GMC training program. And we compared that to what the run through trainees are doing, especially trainees. And I th we think it's a removal and fitting of vaginal pessary and biopsy genital skin, because we are requiring people to be competent in these procedures, but trainees only have to do them up to level three, which is do it under observation. So we missed this completely. And so uh, at the moment, um, put it on hold and we're gonna go back to the GMC and sort out what we do here, because either uh, Caesar and especially trainees do it to level three, or they both do it to um, being competent to the procedure, but you can't have equivalence means equivalence across the board. So thank you to the person that asked this question because we missed it completely. And once we know the answer, it'll we'll get back on the website as, as part of the FAQs. Um, somebody said, I'm worried that only the five years prior to CESA application is looked at and this will jeopardise my application if I have to take time off, for example, maternity leave. Is it true? And the answer is yes, it is true. Um, how old evidence can be is, is set out by the GMC because um, somebody gaining equivalence has to be currently competent. And looking at when we, when we were doing this piece of work for the GMC and looking across other um, specialties, five years tended to be the longest people were allowed to look back for um, being signed off as um, competent to doing something. In our um, SSG, and if you look in the SIPs, the time frame ranges from three to five years, um, unless it's one of these certifications that we all have to do every year, like basic life support, in which case it's one year. Um, and so the whole thing is about competency. Now, the GMC uh, said to us before that if somebody had something they really wanted to pull out from the past and maybe it was because it was six years ago or maybe it pushed seven years ago and it was something highly academic, an exception could be made. But if you wanted to ask for an exception, you please take it up with the GMC because we are only the arm of the GMC that looks at the equivalents. This, uh, this, this part of the fact, all the other faculty training, apart from the specialty, is faculty read, led, faculty run, faculty everything. This is a GMC program. That, that, that faculty supports and are very happy to support. So unfortunately it is five years, um, but um, if, it, as I say, if it's something vital, by all means ask, but don't ask us because the gift is the GMC's gift. 
Okay, Sam. I'm just going to leave people to interrupt if they want, just keep on going. Uh, would CESA candidate have access to the ePortfolio? The answer is yes. You can collate evidence for CESA submission in the ePortfolio. It's got all the documents required, but please note it helps you to organise your material, but doesn't count as submission. You still have to take it off the ePortfolio and get it in the format the GMC wants to submit. And the cost of the ePortfolio is £79 a year. And if you contact Sam, um, he's the one who will arrange ePortfolio access. Okay, Sam. And quite, I mean, a lot of people are using the ePortfolio, which I think is it's really good. Um, there are. I think That's a question. Can, I think we can be more supportive when people use the ePortfolio. Question? Sorry, I just wanted to check. I'm already using the ePortfolio. Yeah. When the curriculum changes in August, is there going to be a new ePortfolio that I need to transfer to or no, it's just continue? No, the transfer is going to be automatic. So you're going to still have the same account, the same login. You still have all of the forms that you already have submitted and signed off. You'll, every item in your personal library is going to stay the same and it's going to be there. So not, nothing is going to change but the fact that you'll have access to the new forms. Fab, thank you. Did I miss something, Kim? No, that's <laughs> um, and so the new portfolio will be available on the 1st of August of this year. As I say, it should be, it should be painless. Okay, Sam, there's all portfolio questions coming up now. Um, training, and there will be a guide. Sam, do we, have, do we have anything more than the guide for people who, I've got great sympathy with somebody who said they weren't IT literate. Can, can we offer more than just read this and see how you get on? So the guide, I'm, I'm compiling the guide at the moment, and it goes through basically step by step with pictures. How the portfolio works, how you can, you know, submit your forms, how you can create your forms, how you can submit tickets. But um, if that is not enough, I'm also happy to take calls and help people kind of guide you through. We can set up a meeting or something. And if you have specific questions, we can address them. I'm just wondering, I'm thinking out loud here. Um, is it worth our while? Because we're going to be working with the TPDs uh, for for local support. Um, if we could identify, I don't know, current trainees who use the ePortfolio who could maybe buddy up, would that be a good thing to try and look for? Because I would think the current trainees more than anybody else, the more senior trainees, absolutely will understand the ePortfolio. They will know more than anybody. Definitely. Yeah. So we try between us, if you make that, we would, let's try and set something up. Yeah, trainees who are willing to put the names forward to be supportive to, uh, and particularly if it's somebody locally, that make that be even better. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think local because local understands the local circumstances. Even though local now with with this, there's no such thing as local anymore like there used to be. Okay, can you forward emails the documents to the ePortfolio then update up then update? Sorry, then load and link later. And Sam, you said this wasn't available. No, it's not available. It's, there's not a function that we have on the NES ePortfolio. Um, you can upload documents to your personal library and then link them. So, you, so just say you wanted, somebody sent you an email and you actually wanted that email because it sounded being nice about you. Would you Photoshop it and put it in or how would you store that? You can screenshot it, you can, um, I don't know if you can upload the actual email file, but probably a screenshot would be the best thing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just that extra step in between that's not necessary for other procedures. That's what yeah. I was hoping for. Is a public, now somebody asked, could I clarify on publication requirements? And I'm not sure what sort of clarification they need beyond what's in the SIP on the SSG. I don't know if any of you guys asked this question or whether Sam just gets back to the person that asked it and said, could you tell me a bit more detail of what you want? I wasn't, I, I'm, can anybody think what might be meant here? Okay, we'll just move on then Sam and we'll dig a bit deeper for that one. Is diagnostic hysteroscopy competence needed new curriculum uh, not therapeutic, and yes, it's just diagnostic hysteroscopy now. I think the main difference between the old curriculum and the new curriculum, apart from the, the tick boxy part of it, 
that's gone is actually there's less in it than there used to be because it was appreciated that we were training people to a higher level than was required for the jobs they were applying for and, and getting. So therapeutic hysteroscopy came out, quite a lot of sexual assault came out. Um, what else came out? I think maybe some colposcopy come out. So yeah, the good news now is it's just diagnostic hysteroscopy. It's much more achievable. Okay. OSAT's the new curriculum are different. So back to OSATs again. And Kim, you've I think you've answered that about if you're on the old for, if you're on, don't change anything you've done. If it's done and signed off, then it's completely acceptable to use it. But you know, if you can switch on to new forms, that would be good. I think the new forms are more supportive of what you're trying to do, Kim. I think you have to you have to from the first of August use. Oh, you do, forms. sorry. Yeah, they were the old forms won't be available to download. Ah. from the 1st of August. Um, but the ones that you've done will still be there, if that makes sense. Um, so, but you won't, so if you're wanting to do a new, another OSAT, you have to use the new form from the 1st of August. But given that we know that some people, or well, many people, find the website and the faculty difficult to use and they Google, they could Google and come up with an old form we wouldn't, if that happened by accident, we wouldn't kick it out, would we? We'd still accept it. But ideally, yeah. people would be using the e-portfolio and, and the links current in the SSG. But the, the, the forms on, so for, for what we've, we did for CESA candidates particularly, is to put the new forms onto the website, recognising that not everyone has access to the e-portfolio. And those are the new forms. So, so yes, you can use those. If you are using the e-portfolio, you can use you have to use the old forms until the first of August. It's entirely because of the of the, um, the just the switch over, technically speaking, either will be acceptable ultimately. Yeah. I think that's what we're saying. And no penalty, um, no penalty yeah. for old forms. But if you're using the e-portfolio, then you can only use the new forms after the first of August. I think maybe it's worth it um, to share where the new Caesar things live on mm. the website. Yeah, we could I do think, that. Mm. Yeah, Let's I can do that. quickly That's a good idea. share my screen. Because the things that are on the website are in the new format. Yeah. Um, so um, you you can you can use those now. <laughs> So this is the faculty website. This is the homepage. When you land here, you go on to education and training, and then you scroll all the way down. And here there's a tile called certificate, you know, Caesar. So you go here and then everything is here. All of the information that we have currently up to date about Caesar, it's all here. And when we talk about forms, then you can download them all here. Other forms are here. There is links to the FAQs that are going to get created. There's the links to the SSG and the applicant guide as well. So everything is all in one place and all of this will be updated as we go along. Can you just go back to the previous big screen under with the workforce one? Yeah. About one before. Yeah, so this is all under workforce. <laughs> and I oh, think- it's it's got got 2BD, 2BD. That's okay. And just just for a few, uh, advisory appointments, it's quite in, people who are asking about um, particularly those currently doing other specialties who are looking about seasoning over or continuing their specialty and then maybe looking for jobs in CSRH. It's quite interesting to look in that bit because that tells you the sort of things are that are in um, job descriptions. That's only reason I'm bringing that one up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sam. I'll go back to the questions. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, somebody asked, has the process become less cumbersome and drawn out than past? And I asked Jane Dixon to answer this one because Jane's been, she went through it herself and, and she's supporting us through now. And, she's, and she says, absolutely. And, and she was part of the team that put together the new SSG to 
because with the new curriculum, it's easier to draw on and demonstrate historical experience rather than have to sign off on a specific number of procedures. That is, if you're competent, that's what signed off the new curriculum rather than a number of procedures it took you to get there and when they occurred. And I think one of the good examples Jane gave that was one of the principles putting together the, the, the Caesar SSG was, in the old day it was, you had to do, to show you had done a course in how to do PowerPoint. Now, show us a PowerPoint. If you can show us a PowerPoint that shows you how to use PowerPoint, we're not interested in you doing a course. You've proved you're able to do it by a PowerPoint presentation. Now that PowerPoint presentation may also be a presentation of maybe an audit you did. And then you can tick two boxes with the one PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and um, so you were saying that, you know, so it's like with the public health project, it demonstrates your knowledge rather than, than ticking all the courses you've been on and all the things you've done, you demonstrate you've got the, the competency by doing the project. So Jane's very pro, and I think that's probably the best um, praise we've got for going forward and saying it. it it's Caesar's still a, a mountain to climb, but it should be a less jaggy mountain than it was in the past. Okay. And it's probably worth mentioning as well, Kate, that one piece of evidence can be linked across three different SIPs up to seven times. So each of the SIPs has a number of key skills. Um, and so one piece of evidence could be used across three different SIPs and linked to a number of key skills. So it's meant to, meant to um, focus on the quality rather than the quantity of evidence. So you, if, you did a, if you did some work on, I don't know, washing hands and hygiene, that you presented as an audit to your team as a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> you could use it for PowerPoint skills, audit skills, and probably some place in your management skills. That'd be three places, wouldn't it? That's, that's, that's the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah. I think Sarah has a question. Hi, sorry to I keep asking questions. Um, I was looking on the GMC guidance for Caesar, um, and it still says that you have to have, to be signed up as competent, you have to have three summative OSATs, and then you have to continue to get two summative OSATs per year to demonstrate continued competence um, for all of the procedures. Is that still the case? Because that was in the GMC guidance. Not at all. Once you've done it, that's it. So once you've got the three? What, when, yes, once you're signed off, you're signed off. I, I'll go back and look at it again, but I'm quite sure the intention was not for that. I mean, as long as you signed off within the past, what, well, be five years or three years, whatever it says in the SIP, that's mm -hmm. the end of it. Okay. Um, I know that for, for the trainees going through the programme, they need to show that they, well, they don't need to show, but their continued competency is taken into account. But for the whole Caesar ethos is you show that you've got equivalent experience or the equivalent skills, experience, competencies. So yeah. once and it's it. So you for example, do every year until you apply. You, you do it and that's it done, provided it's done within the past five years. Fine, that's good, thank you. And I think somebody who said, you know, I, I did, did OG in the past. So it may be just say, in the past you were okay at hysteroscopies, but you haven't done them for six or seven years. Then it'd be a case of going back, having a, a bit of, you know, updating and, and just getting somebody to do the OSATs, then that's you back up again. Fine, thank you. I'll double check on that, but that's not the intention at all. Yeah. Okay. I had a question, sorry I joined late because of technical issues. I'm sorry, could you say that again? You're a bit distant. Could you say again? Sorry, I joined late because of technical issues. I had a question. Uh, yeah. About uh, the same, the OSAR, so uh, like a termination of pregnancy I've done last year, so I don't have to continue doing it to show that I'm competent. It's done and it's, it's submitted, that's it. Yep. Uh, tips on completing the application. All we can say is do exactly what the GMC wants you to do. And the GMC goes through the whole thing um, I, I know from the ones that I've done, they, they may send them back to the applicant till they are happy, they've got everything they want. 
Then they show it to faculty and we go through it to check equivalence. We are an assessor's panel and, the G and then it goes back to GMC. So just make sure the GMC are happy. I've always found them, Kim, you, we've always found them really nice if you ring them up and ask them questions. Yeah, they're, 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 they're really, really helpful. They're super helpful. Yeah, so. they, really, they, they want it to work. Mm. And um, it's always useful to speak to somebody or somebody's plural who've been through it. And any quiz at all, just speak to the GMC. I, I don't think I can see anything more than that, really. Uh, in, in the SSG, the first part of the SSE, it, it, there's a bit that says, where have people fallen down in the past? And there may be six or seven things that we say that the GMC has sent it back because it's not been completed um, correctly. And these were the main ones and they've identified them. Addressing gaps in experience. Um, how do you do this? Um, and I, I just said, look, look at where the gaps are, go through the curriculum, see where your gaps are. Do you need to be updated? and to be current um, and approach your colleagues for help? Or do you need to go in a course? Um, and there are modules and courses to fill gaps So in knowledge. So it depends, you know, is your experience a, 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 a knowledge? Well, experience, I suppose, implies technical skills. And um, it's a really good idea, I think, to use the FSLH mentoring scheme that we're setting up um, or contact Sam for support if you feel that um, there's, you're a bit lost about how to um, fill in a gap you've identified or you, you're struggling. I mean, for example, oh, um, I sent out an email recently because I know a lot of people have been finding it really difficult to get a surgical termination of pregnancy competencies just because of COVID. And, and that, so if you couldn't find, you know, if you, I think a lot of us are still friends and we're going to try and set up a network so there's very identical friends you can get in touch with. But if, if you find a gap and you're not quite sure how to fill it, then please get in touch with us and we'll, we'll try and give you advice there. Any additional experience would be at your own expense and time. I suppose the bottom line for this would be yes. Um, I had a chat to the lead dean uh, so I'm up to speed on this and, and his advice is um, if he strongly recommends you approach your local director of med at medical education, the, the associate po postgraduate dean or the SAS champion in your deanery. They, every deanery should have a budget and a lead for SAS doctors. Uh, or, and, or the, and they may have a separate CSER lead. I went through all the deanery websites and it varied from deanery websites with loads to deanery websites where I couldn't find anything. But the dean assures me that every single deanery, there is somebody who is paid, it's their role to support Caesar SES. And they have a budget. Now the budget's for all the specialties, but the budget is, is to support um, Caesar candidates either in courses, backfilling your, your posts can be freed up and help you achieve your training needs. I mean, they may challenge you, that's why you want to do Caesar, but they, they're, they're there to help you. If, and I said, well, what happens if you're not in an organization linked to Adrini, Adrini, for example, the organization I was in um, was a, a, a small independent organization, even though we did NHS work. And the answer there was, well, Adina is not much used to under those circumstances, but within your organization, go to whoever runs the training budget and plead your course and try and get support within the organization. Um, the only other way to get financial support that we know of is the faculty has a small and finite pot. Uh, I'm emphasizing finite. I, I, I have yet, Sam's trying to find out how much is left in the pot so we can, effectively warn CSER candidates well ahead of time when the pot comes to an end. It's called a top-up fund and there is information on the CSER uh, webpage and that will support training posts, uh, I think, uh, or support training uh, towards CSER um, up to £5,000. Okay. Right, so CSER, well, obviously from the people here today, um, people have done ONG training and then gone on to CSER. And a question somebody asked, well, uh, would I have to give up my ONG training numbers if possible to do dual, dual CCT CSER? Um, we don't have dual CCT. So um, 
if you're on the specialty register, you don't need to do CESA because you're on the specialty register. CESA is a certificate of equivalence of specialty registration. So um, my advice would be either you're early on in your specialty training and you hate it and you don't want to continue any further, in which case you would come out and get into a post that would hopefully support you in achieving all the competencies as you work towards CESA or you would apply to get on the specialty training program. The specialty, specialty training program um, for CSRH is, I believe, the most sought after specialty training program. Over 100 applicants, quite often, just certainly for less than 10 posts, sometimes just two or three posts a year. Looking for more numbers, in reality, that's where we are right now. So I think if you're currently in a specialty training program, it's do a stick with this and see it through, because I will then be on the specialist register. And while I'm going through this specialty training program, you know, can I do, if it's an obs and gynae, you would do, can you do ATSMs? Can you do attachments? Can you do projects? Can you do management to support? Which will all tick the right boxes for applying for a job in CSRH. So I was speaking to somebody who is an ST5 out of seven years in obs and gynae. She says she can't bear to go on to complete seven years. So in her last two years, she's going to do ATSMs, um, which I think there's one in abortion care and one in, in sexual health. That'll help her um, get a lot of experience in those two areas. It'll cover some gum. And then she, uh, she could do a project on labor ward, which might be around postpartum contraception, a very hot topic, really good experience for her. And then map what she's done against what's required um, uh, it, to, to get a job in uh, CSRH. Um, we're very happy if anyone would approach us to give you some, that's why I've got Sam to look on the website, it gives you some clues of what's looked for. Any job description has, if you haven't got a, a CCT in CSRH, you have to have the MFSRH, and then there's got other things we want you to have. So it would be a case of um, really, I, I've in here, referred to it as just, getting your portfolio, getting the right portfolio together and filling the gaps so you can apply for ONG jobs with your um, Ops and Gynae CCT. And uh, I said, I can't think of anyone who's started ONG and gone to CSRH, but of course there's been loads even today and people attending. Does that make sense to those of you here and those that you're going through it? That's that the sort of advice that you'd expect to see and give? Hi, I was just wondering, because obviously you can do dual CCT in some specialties. And obviously, as I know, GUM's moving to dual CCT with GUM and Gen Meds. Is there any plans in the future to move uh, to, to be able to dual CCT and say ONG and SRH, GUM, SRH? Um, or is that not going to be possible full stop? Um, can I just answer that? I think the short answer is no. OK. Um, it, it, it... It is an unbelievable process getting approval for a new program through GMC to get a dual CCT through GMC. I can't begin to think about how complicated that would be. Um, I don't think they'd wear it. Um, okay. a, a dual CCT with gum or ONG. Um, I just don't think they'd, they'd, they'd buy it at all. Um, so um, that is not part of the discussions that are currently taking place in the faculty. In, uh, either so no one would be pushing for this so I think it's best to be upfront about that really. No that's really helpful thank you so much um, and I think that's really helpful to know that you can apply for consultant posts with a different CCT as long as you've kind of fulfilled all the criteria they'd want from the post so that's really really helpful thank you. Yeah, the most important one is the MFSRH. Maybe okay. if I can offer some kind of perspective on this, because I also look after the um, advisory appointments committees. Okay. Um, so there are, there's a shortage of consultants in CSRH. So that's the reality of the fact. And there is a crisis in our workforce. And as you all know, probably uh, most services are going towards an integrated sexual health service and module. So there are some posts that are kind of hybrid. Um, and some things like leading on com complex com contraception or leading on level three contraception and leading the services are reserved for people that have CCT or CSER in CSRH. But there is an appetite and um, 
a need and a want for people that, for example, come from ONG or come from GUM and have the competences and the skill to work in an integrated uh, service where there are both uh, perspectives being represented. Yes, I think what we're saying is anybody, particularly from ONG and GUM, is really, really, really welcome <laughs> to become part of the family. I, I think that's why it's interesting on the website to see that especially training is under workforce because we have a desperate shortage for workforce uh, at, at, at consultant level. And we're a very greying population. Um, actually for everybody, for current, people currently in GUM, people currently in primary care and people currently uh, in um, ONG, does that make sense? Is that quite hopeful? Because the other thing I would add is, and I've got down here some places that, you know, while you're doing your gum or, or gynae training, uh, we're very happy to help you make links with, the, if you haven't done so already, with your local uh, CRSH lead. And they can maybe, you know, if, if, when I was a trainee, I when I when the light bulb came on for me, because I had Dobson gynae, I, I made a local link and I did um, family planning sessions. And that got me into the family planning world. I, I got to know family planning in those days. Yeah, I got to know the local characters. You know, and, and I, be, I became at home in CSRH while I was still a gynaecologist. If that makes any sense. And then it meant that when I was looking for jobs, and people knew I was looking for jobs, then you know, proactively thought, oh, well, somebody here. She's coming through quite soon. She's got community ability. She's got hospital ability. And and people tweak job descriptions when they know there's somebody in the doorstep that's got what they need. So uh, as many local links as you can forge, I'm saying local because local is easy, but any as many links as you can forge in your training years, the better when it comes to your final job. It doesn't have to be local, but it's, um, it, but, but I know that trainees in the last year or so, just look at what jobs are being advertised so they can see what people are looking for. And there are a lot of jobs which either have a bit of guidance in them or certainly a, a lot, a, a very strong link with GU. And I think what's happening just now, to be fair, is that uh, places are looking for CSRH leads, can't find them, they're, so they're tweaking the job description to make them more attractive to GUM graduates. I think what, by reviewing job descriptions, what you find a lot is the membership exam and uh, special skills modules. So abortion care, menopause, um, sometimes vasectomies, but mostly abortion care, menopause and ultrasound. And um, sometimes as well, letter of competence in intrauterine techniques or subdermal implants. So if you come through ONG, you can get that through the ATSMs. Yeah. Look. Any concessions? From, I think this is from an obstetrician gynecologist, and the answer is for Caesar, there's no concessions for anyone. You, know, you, you have to go through Caesar, there's no shortcuts. You just have to do what the SSG says. But if you're on a specialist register, there's no need to do Caesar. Just, uh, just achieve the appropriate skills required to, you know, to apply for a job, and you have to have the MFSRH for CRSH consultant posts. I think possibly we've covered the GU question here with the discussion we've had up till now. No, Kim? That's, I mean, from my perspective, it was me that asked that. So That's I'm nice. really happy with you guys okay. having okay. answered that completely. Okay, next. Um, this person has the F MFSRH, is a GP, leading community guide, it may be uh, the lady that's here. Uh, but additional experience, it's the same, irrespective of your CV, to get Caesar, you have to go through the whole um, Caesar um, SSG. It sounds from the job you're doing, actually, you've got experience to do most things really, really quickly. You did yeah. answer. It, it's, it's interesting. Really I haven't, there are some things that I haven't perhaps noticed fully on the curriculum, which I suppose are a bit uh, daunting when you're already working in yeah. in sort of service delivery roles so I'm, I'm not a trainee and I'm sort of doing eight sessions a week in my two with my two hats for example being fully competent to ST5 at an MVA surgical termination of pregnancy mm, is going to be and, and and part of me feels that there's the sorts of services locally that would 
um, be looking for an SRH lead or a consultant. So, for example, if we decided that the community gynae service needed a consultant lead, which we're not necessarily going to do, but if we did, it wouldn't be the same role but for somebody that would be doing a surgical termination of pregnancy clinic or a vasectomy clinic or a GUM clinic with light microscopy. But it sounds like to be a CESA accredited consultant, you'd need to be fully competent at ST5 level in all of those different areas, even though in reality, certainly in, in England and in this part of England, an SRH lead role probably wouldn't have all of those things yeah. as something that they would continue to practice. So I suppose mm-hmm. that puts me off a bit because the thought of having to do all those things to that level. And then to, the to do, Yeah, and to do what I effectively I'm already doing to a degree at a sort of service lead level makes me think, oh, that's a bit daunting. <laughs> and it's not fair, is it? Well, and our trainee said the same. Um, when with a very, I mean, we've only been a specialist in something like, I don't know, 2012 or something. And the trainee said, why are we having to do all these when in our final job you may not be doing vasectomy you may mm. not be doing TOP you may not be doing genital biopsies and the answer is the trouble is we don't know <laughs> because yeah. we don't know what the final job is we cover everything and that's why in the redo of the curriculum that's just been done uh, some things have been dropped um, there's various reasons for dropping them but one of them is actually if you need this skill then you can do it as what well, credentialing or something once you have your CCT but I realise um, it is an issue for somebody that's really experienced and valued like yourself mm. to do things that actually will, will ever need them yeah and it's, yeah because from a knowledge base perspective it seems really accessible for somebody that's got a lot of gynaecology and family planning um, a bit of public health background but from a practical perspective unless you're going to make a lot of time and and training for practical procedures is really difficult to access now I I did apply to do my deep implant training last year because I fit lots of implants in general practice and the response from the local SRH service was that there's not a need for that locally um, even though the waiting lists are immense um, and they'd rather have someone doing lots of them than than lots of people doing few of them and so it wasn't supported and so it's really difficult because you feel like actually access to training for practical procedures is really really difficult to come by unless you are a trainee in that in that area. I'm going to try and memorize what you're saying here because one of the things we're doing is we're going to be making links with training with training program directors and it's uh, so they can have local champions to support CESA candidates because historically it's I know that SES doctors and potential CESA candidates feel bumped every time a trainee comes along. Mm. Trainee comes along, everybody else gets shoved aside because the trainee has to get the training, for example, in in ultrasound. It's always ultrasound because they have got this training program they've got to get through in a finite amount of time. And um, the reality is with the workforce situation it is, you know, we have to give non-trainees access to training. Mm. So I'm going to be working closely with the TPDs to try and filter down to local level. So someone like you, okay, they may not consider, they, they may, con- this is my view, they may consider that they don't need somebody else doing deep implants, but your aim is to train. Mm. Your aim is not to, to deliver in the service. Yeah. yeah. And because yeah. you may not end up working there. I mean, you may yeah. train in, in, I don't know, Devon and end up working in Burness in the real world. Yeah. Theory. So it's about looking at yes you have a service but we 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 actually have an obligation to train yeah because the other thing that sometimes makes it difficult but again perhaps more in England is that there's such a fragmentation at the moment between SRH and sort of um what's so what's commissioned by public health and what's commissioned by NHS England and it makes going from one area to the other and and intercrossing those quite challenging um, and I think for, I think it's very challenging for the educational supervisors uh, and TPDs for, for especially trainees, but it's what they're doing, mm. and they have been doing it for, you know, through this whole nonsense that started off with Lansley. Don't get me started. <laughs> so that's where if we're going to really try and and beef up the CESA program, we have to piggyback onto anybody that's out there that can help us help you achieve your training needs, mm. uh, you know and. You, we, we can only try um but that would be one way i would look at it but I, I i can totally understand your frustration and i think it's the frustration in the past that associate specialists always had doing a really good job 
and then the job adverts for a consultant to do the job they've been doing perfectly yeah. adequately for years but you know you've got little gaps and it's hugely frustrating what else can I see uh Sam what else have you got next Yes, there you are, <laughs> you should, yeah, there, there are doctors, I spoke to Jane Dixon, yes, there's certainly doctors who are dual accredited because there's two registers, you're on each, you're on both registers and you can lead two lives if you wish, continue with, if anything in more detail, by all means ask the GMC, but yes, you're just on both registers. Okay, fine. Okay, and, and these, that's questions that came in. Now, has anybody thought of anything else since or anything that we've not covered or we've confused you with? as part of today. I mean, I, I worry, no, I'm, I'm not worried. I am very clear that we are very clear. We want to support CSER applicants or potential applicants as much as we can, but it is, you know, it's, it's very much a work in progress. We had a meeting last week for uh, past CSER candidates who've been successful, who um, are currently our assessors and they're going to be the pool we're going to draw Caesar mentors from, I think we're not called the mentors, we're probably going to call them champions uh, to have. So, I, you know, right now, I know people have been asking for mentors because we say we're going to get them. We haven't got them yet, but we're working towards that. Uh, we're working towards linking with the TPD so we can have somebody perhaps near where you live that's got more grassroots not roots knowledge locally to help you get what you need, particularly, particularly if you manage to get a an SAS lead or a Caesar lead in the deanery who can free up some finance so you can do training. Um, and I think that's probably it for me to say uh, what our aspirations are. I see a hand up, Sarah. Hi, sorry again. <laughs> no, um, so I just wanted to double check about the sexual assault training. Um, so obviously I'm already seeing sexual assault patients in gum clinic and um, sort of in general clinic for their follow-up. Um, and obviously we do get initial disclosures as well. Um, so if I were to go on sort of a Havens course and then do CBDs and reflections on the people that I'm already seeing um, and submit them as evidence, would that be sufficient? I would think so, but right now in my head, I haven't got what's required for sexual assault in CIP-8. Sam, can you pull that up quickly? Either I can get back to you about it. Yeah, that would be helpful for me too, because I, I used to do the job I used to do forensic gynecology, but I haven't done it for over 10 years. And locally, the service will just not consider having anybody um, to come out on calls or anything with COVID. So I would probably need to go to England or Scotland or Wales to get that covered? I'm struggling to get it in Wales, so I'm going oh, really? to well, in Wales then. to get it. And I don't know whether if I just did, you know, like the RCOG strategy, if I did some sort of update course, whether that would cover or do I actually need physical experience update? Um, I'm going to get it in Scotland as well. Let's 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 have a look. The other thing is I can't remember what the word is, but the GMC certainly is being approached by the specialty. With um, there's just no way people can get the hands-on training because of COVID, and that cannot mm. permit um, a training program to grind to halt. And likewise, it cannot permit the CISA process to grind to halt because the reality is, if you can't get trained, you can't get trained. Let's see what they're asking for. I was actually sorry, Sam. I was thinking about the SIP, our SIP in uh, the SSG. That's not the SSG. I thought I was thinking just to see what we're asking for. Uh, yeah. There you go. Manager sexual violence is there. Um, look at good, yeah. So down, down from that. Uh, current training. Forensic sexual assault examiner's course or equivalent. Okay. Evidence. Down a bit. 
you're down near the bottom of the evidence. Nothing there, nothing practical there. That's because since all this started, the forensic positions have got up and running. Oh, so that's key skills, anonymized logs of experience. Well, that would certainly be the patients that you come across in your clinic. Workplace assessment log boots, uh, critical incidents. Okay, scroll, scroll, scroll. Uh, clinics. Well, certainly, um, sexual assault would come into clinics you do because it's part of your routine caseload. Scroll down. Well, from what, what you said, I would have thought what you did was sufficient because it, they just want to see that you can um, deal with patients suffering from sexual assault, as in knowing what to do with them before and after, because the during bit is the actual examination and diagnosis and whatnot is now with the specialists. Mm. That would be yeah. my feeling. Sam, could you just park that so we can have a bit more, so we can have a proper FAQ in this? And yep. maybe something that we need to take back to the GMC to say the reality is right now that these doctors, just, they are doing it as part of the day job. They are seeing sexual assault patients as, as part of um, routine care. Um, and, and we're just not expecting you to do the fine detail of forensic work that we did with the last curriculum. So I would think what you're doing is enough. Uh, does that help you, Siobhan? Yeah, again, I, I would be fitting a lot of emergency coils. Um, we take a lot of referrals from our local um, SARC unit um, and I'm happy to do, um, you know, I think the RCOG strategy ones, maybe the, one of the, the better ones. I did have a look a couple of months ago and I didn't find very many other online courses. We'll pick that one up. And we'll tighten up on that one then to give you better advice around that. Yeah, that would be great because that, that's one of my outstanding bits. Okay. Does that sound okay, Kim? Any other questions? I had a question about publication. Ah, I didn't understand the publications question. I was going to email you if it was you. Could you have a bit more? Could you tell me a bit more of what you were asking that over and above what's in the SSG? So uh, the question was about like one has to have a publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Yeah. So could it be a, a publication in a book, or it has to be a peer-reviewed journal uh, only? Uh, first author. Um, I think. I mean, I think. I mean, what do you mean by book? Um, I would think if it was a book which the equivalence committee or the, equivalent, the assessors thought was a standard book, not just a handbook between friends, but a proper, a proper book, then I think that would be perfectly acceptable. If, if, if you were down as the, as the chapter author or if you were an editor or something like that, off the top of my head, that would be fine. But I was confused whether it has to be only a peer reviewed journal or... No, you, you've got a point. I think... Um, what the GMC mentioned. Yeah, um, I know we've stipulated journals, but I'm quite sure we could have flexibility around books. Don't, Kim, Kim, she's got a bit of college experience. Well, not not a lot of experience. Kim, have you any comment on it? You're muted. Kim? You're on mute, Kim. Mute. Kim, you're muted. I'm oh, sorry. I'm just, I'm just having a quick look at the SIP. Um, I think, I think we've got journals as in is it expected, and then books under documentation required. Certificates of a course is there. Recommended them to peer review publications either published or that have been accepted. Is, that, is it under recommended? Recommended, right. yeah. If it's recommended, then we then that's it's only recommended. And I would certainly say, I would say a, a chapter in a book would do in amongst recommended because the recommended ones are the things that we could think of. It, it's not an, ex, an ex, it's the things we could think of that would give you an idea of what you could possibly do. It, but it's not, ex, it's not exclusive. So a book could be fine. That doesn't break anything we've got, Kim, does it? 
I don't think so, no. But yeah. we might think about adding that to our recommended evidence. Uh, we can have it in an FAQ as well. I mean, can we? I don't know how much we can change that without the GMC considering well, that this review. Is the thing. We'd have to. Would you have to consult with them? Yeah. So I mean, I think if that was in an FAQ, that would let people know without having to. All oh, right. Okay. Go yeah. To the whole GMC, why have you changed your mind about things? Yeah. Okay. The question was about OSATs. For every procedure, three OSATs. What is recommended? And uh, CBT, is there any number for CBT? Uh, Kim or Sam, could, could you say that again? You, you're quite difficult to hear. Sorry, the connection problem here. Uh, so uh, my question was about OSATs. For every procedure, three OSATs are recommended? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah it's three summative OSATs per procedure. What about how many mini kegs or CBD for three or for every, uh, like, uh, you know, for, for, for let's say somebody with irregularity? So, three CBDs per, um, per will be enough, or when is there enough? What, what we were saying is, is that um, you, you do a summative assessment and that's it, finished. As long as it's within the past either three or five years, whatever we stipulated in the SIP, you don't oh, have to show yeah. regular updating unless unless we say so in the SIP. So if you've got um, if you've proven you're competent in I don't know deep implant removal in the past five years, that's the end of it. And because of the sort of difference between the GMC SSG and obviously what the curriculum saying, do I need to clarify that with the GMC first? No, we will clarify that, um, as Kate was saying earlier on. Um, we just we just need to get our, um, our our lines straight. So don't you be contacting the GMC about it. We'll be doing that. Um, will you send out an email once you have, just so that we we're not doing it sort of. What will happen is that the procedures will be updated on the website if there are any changes. Fine. Um, Another question about ultrasound gynecology. So I've done an SSM uh, that was 2014. Can I do it in, in my community gynae clinic? Do I have to produce, like, what would I need to give more uh, for CESAR purposes? Again, OSATs or anything else? Or do yeah. I have um, my understanding is that you would do a work but you would do a workplace-based assessment showing that you have the competencies as laid down in the curriculum. So don't go back doing more courses and all that sort of stuff. If you're doing it as your day job, get somebody to assess you by whatever is the best workplace based assessment to show that you can do what is required in the curriculum. Are you okay with that, Kim? Anything you're thinking that? Oh, that's fine. No anxieties, okay. So is that us, do you think? Oh, yeah, right. So uh, any questions, any other questions about anything at all, even if it's not to do with anything that's cropped up here, anything? Um, Kate, I, I haven't um, got any portfolio at the minute. I had started quite a while ago, so I'd printed out the old logbook and I'd been using that as a, as a basis. Um, because I'm sort of quite close to starting submission, should I just do the GMC format? Um, is there any point in me starting to complete the e-portfolio as well, or is that going to be doubling the I, workload? You'll be on the new curriculum or the old curriculum? So be the, I'm going to do the new curriculum. Good. Kim? I would, I would say that it wouldn't be worth you getting an e-portfolio because yeah. all you'd be up do, doing is uploading stuff you've already completed on, on paper, is it? So it, to me, that wouldn't be... Yeah. Intending to, to go to the GMC, you'll be submitting all your documentation in their format on uploading onto GMC Connect. Um, so if it were me and it's all in paper form, I would just do that rather than get an e-portfolio because as, as you've correctly identified, you'd just be doing it twice I think yeah. the benefit of the portfolio um, is for, for when you're really starting to acquire evidence, if you've already got a shed load, but not in the portfolio. I'm not so sure it's a great use of your time to be. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's a bit 
bit daunting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the GMC Connect website isn't isn't the sexiest thing in the world. It, they haven't changed it for about fifteen years. It's quite clunky, but okay. You're going to have to upload it anyway. Scan it and upload it. You may as well just do it once because once it's on GMC Connect, it's available to you anyway. You can see it and stuff. So, yeah. Um, so okay. That would be my take on it if it were me. I, I was on a, a Caesar workshop a couple of weeks ago and it almost put me off. They were talking about having to get PDF, a PDF editor to change documents into PDF format. It all sounded completely beyond my technical capabilities. <laughs> Has anybody any experience of, of that? So your logbook's paper. Yes, but I, I was just using it. it. Was it's the old, it's the old um, curriculum. So I was using that just as a, a basis to work out what courses and what all I needed to do. And obviously, I know it has has changed slightly. Um, so all that you would need to do, if I'm, I'm going to be really out here on a limb, you know how to scan a document. Yes, I know how to do that. Yeah. Okay. So that will be a PDF. Okay. Yeah, they, they seem to talk about having to get an editor and it's, I, it's I, enough, I, I think, the PDF you, editor you app. Around with it. I, 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 as far as I'm aware, that once you scan something, it's a, in PDF format automatically. That's just, just off the top. Okay, of that. so that, I that's... wrong about that, but, but I can't see why you would need a PDF editor. Yeah. Because you're, okay. you're actually just scanning documents. You're not changing them. You're, you're kind of, that's them. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really have things signed off because I've no real educational supervisor. There's no consultants in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, CSRH doesn't exist in Northern Ireland. So yeah. I'm sort of um, on my own entirely with this. Um, it's just a matter of getting other, getting gynecologists and other I, people to sign things off for me. Yeah, I don't think they have to be consultants. Do they? They have to be trainers, Kim. You can That's be trainer, right. but you, I mean, consultants are trainers, but I mean, in the, your peers, your peers can sign you off for, for the concept of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably all done. Um, but yeah, I can imagine the problem. It says here there. in the SSG, submitted OSATs must be completed by two different assessors, and it just says assessors. Yeah. Yeah, I think ideally the assessors should be themselves, should be trainers. I think that's the, what, what, what's an assessor, somebody who's been trained. Uh, but again, um, we, we discussed this at length. Why two assessors? Why not one assessor when sometimes two or three assessors are difficult to get? And I think the answer would be is if you were someplace, particularly right now, who could only get one assessor, that would be the sort of thing to... Um, speak to GMC about say, look, this is the reality of the way things are with COVID. Uh, can I get by with one assessor? And the GMC will either give a straight answer to that or they'll come and ask us. And my answer would be one assessor is good enough for me. You know, ideally, it should be two different people. Otherwise, it could just mate signing off mates. But I mean, if, if it was a challenge for you, that sort of thing, I would take the GMC and say, this is the reality of where I am. Because the other thing the GMC is very aware of is if they said to you, oh, no, no, you, you need two assessors, and you end up hiking around the country, you might be expiring your five years at the other end. Mm. <laughs> that's really stupid. So um, that, that's where I would rely on the GMC to be sensible about it. I, mean, I don't think, Kim, they'd be any better off coming for us than us going to GMC. I don't, I don't know. To be honest with you, I, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't. I don't know whether whether it'd be better or not, or whether the faculty equipped um, Caesar panel, if they looked at that evidence, said actually that's not sufficient sign off. But well, my, my worry is that the GMC wouldn't let wouldn't let it get as far as the Caesar panel. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So oh, yeah, oh. The best then best always yeah. The, then best to ask them directly. Ask so, the GMC, and if the GMC yeah. give you an answer you don't like, <laughs> come I'm back to us. us and see if we can put some pressure on the GMC. But um, I, I know from listening to the people on the specialty training that the GMC are being very understanding as uh, about um, shall we say tweaking the rules as long as there's no way it would ultimately impact on patient safety. So yeah. they're quite good at being pragmatic about it. 
in terms of Chinese progression, definitely. Chinese progression, yeah. And if yeah. it's Chinese progression, it's equivalence. So if the trainees get it, then the CESA candidates get it. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll do our homework as promised. And then why don't we send out the, what we come up with to all those who attended today, Sam, because you know everybody's name and address and we'll also update the FAQs, but it means that people today are updated on the topics from today. And we, we'll, we're we meeting next Tuesday, so we can give ourselves a, a task list and a time frame to get back to you. Because some of you are quite, quite, you know, quite far advanced in your mm. season mm -hmm. pathway. Mm. Yep. So on you go. Wait, no, there's a question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, here. Yeah. For the technical issues, I could join, I think, 15 minutes late. So will, will this be recorded? Will I get a recording so that I have a time to try? Yeah, so there's going to be a new story about this on the website. I'm going to send an email to everyone that signed up with the link to the video. And the video is also going to be available on the Caesar page. I'll make sure to cover all bases. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, you can just write me an email. I'll also send you the slides with the um, questions and answers so you don't have to wait for me to put them on the website. Um, so yeah, and anything else, you can just write me an email and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And, and the issue about the procedures and the levels, um, I, um, as, as we were saying, we will, um, once that has been sort of sorted out properly, uh, we'll republish the procedures. And um, I think we should, as you suggested, Sarah, we'll, we'll write, just let everyone know what, this, what the, because the SSG may have to be changed as well. Um, so it's not quite as it's, it's not like a like that, um, but yeah, we will get back to you as as soon as quickly as we can on that one. Thank you. Feel free to get in touch throughout your journey with Caesar. I think it's good if you want to keep touch base with us and let us know if you're having any issues or you know what your local situation is as well. Because I mean, the reality is, as you know, it's quite obvious from today's conversation is that. You know, for all of us, this new SSG and this new way of showing equivalence is new. Um, and, and all I can keep reassuring you is the desire is there to help people achieve Caesar as long as we can keep patients safe. So, um, you know, if, if everybody I hope is working to the right side, it's just that it's going to be a bit vague to begin with until well, we even get some Caesar candidates through, I think. But the desire is there for us to support you as much as possible to so there's no tripping over any hurdles ahead of time. Okay. Is that another question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, it's about the paper format. So I was doing on the logbook, the paper format, and I got all my signatures there. But because of the change in the curriculum, like things like therapeutic hysteroscopy, uh, but diagnostic hysteroscopy side, but therapeutic will be left blank. Uh, and that's what I'm going to upload because the new curriculum, that's not a requirement anymore. So how do I get about doing that if I still upload my paper format? Kim, can you? Sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Okay, so uh, I was collecting all my uh, skills, I was getting signatures on a logbook, on paper format. And uh, so, if I'm not going to use the e-portfolio and I'm going to upload the paper documents, because of the change in the curriculum, like it's no more therapeutic hysteroscopy, which I haven't got it signed, I will leave that blank and just uh, uh, and submit that. You don't need to submit it. If you're, if you're submitting against the new curriculum, you don't need to submit it at all. My question format I'm uploading it onto the GMC document and for the purposes but uh, it is the old curriculum logbook okay just put not required just put on it not required yeah. Yeah. or put a line through it or something just you know strike it out so there's no new logbook isn't it uh, at the moment I, I, I mean I just it 
I, I'm trying to visualize the documentation you rec- that you're going to be using because understandably, like Siobhan, you're going to use what you've done in the past before all the changes were made. So, um, I mean, all I can say is only bother uploading what you need to upload. But if Absolutely. it happens, yeah. to, happens to be there and it's not relevant, just put not relevant across it. Yeah. 